Good evening, good morning uh, to all our guests, uh, viewers, listeners, wherever you are on the globe, uh, and welcome to our webinar on gene therapy, uh, a new pathway to deafness treatment, question mark. I'm Eli Reches, uh, the Crown Visiting Professor in Israel Studies at Northwestern, presently um, talking to you, speaking to you from Tel Aviv. I'm the head of the Israel Innovation Project, IIP, and the Israel Liaison at the Office of the Vice President for International Relations at Northwestern University. I'll take a few minutes uh, uh, to make a few quick introductory remarks uh, with regard to today's agenda. So this event is jointly organized by Northwestern and Tel Aviv University, and it represents yet another milestone in a series of uh, collaborative projects undertaken by the two institutions in recent years. Just one recent example, in uh, December 2020, we organized together a panel discussion entitled, quote, in the aftermath of COVID-19, the impact on science and research, uh, where we had two panelists, one from uh, Northwestern, one from Tel Aviv University, very successful one. Today we have uh, our present uh, program and our plans in the pipeline uh, for additional ones in the future. Uh, I should uh, make a point and highlight the fact that all webinars are recorded and can be watched and listened to on our website, on our relevant uh, perspective uh, website and YouTubes. So uh, you can, uh, they can be watched and listened to um, uh, if you didn't have a chance to watch them, you and your uh, friends. A word about IIP, if I may. Uh, it was founded last year uh, to meet a growing demand uh, for collaborative work between Northwestern and Israeli academic institutions with a focus on the field of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, so we shifted uh, towards science and technology, but still our, we have our interest in the traditional definitions of Israel studies, uh, history, politics, uh, society, and in fact, our immediate next uh, event will be uh, in the aftermath of the forthcoming Israeli uh, election to the Knesset. So let's move to today's uh, program and to the order of the day. I will first introduce the two first participants, uh, Professor Dan Peer, who will present greetings on behalf of Tel Aviv University, and then Professor Abigail Forstner, the moderator of our panel discussion. Dan Peer is the Vice President for Research and Development at uh, Tel Aviv University. He's a professor and director of the Laboratory of Precision Nanomedicine at Tau. He was the chair of the Center of uh, Biology Research, uh, which includes 17 affiliated hospitals. Dan Peer is the founding and managing director of the SPARC, program of translational medicine at Tel Aviv University. He has more than 130 pending and granted patents, and he received more than 30 awards and honors. Abigail Forstner is our moderator, and she uh, will introduce the speakers. She is an associate direct, uh, professor at Northwestern Medill School of Journalism, Media, and integrated marketing uh, communication. She directs the health, environment, and science reporting at Medill. Uh, we have a tradition of collaboration with Medill. Our previous um, webinar was uh, moderated by the Dean of Medill, Professor Whitaker, and now we are honored to have Abigail. Abigail is a faculty partner also with the Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern and the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Abigail covered environment, science, and the arts for the Chicago Tribune for many years, and she's completing her fourth book on climate and culture. Let me now hand the mic over to Dan. Dan, the mic is yours. 
Thank you so much, Eli. Um, you know, Tel Aviv University and Northwestern go a long way. So we had joint symposium in the past, also a lot of activity between our nano center and Northwestern Nano Center, the chemistry department, and many, many others, and the School of Medicine, of course, and others. So it's a pleasure to be here, to hear two outstanding scientists in a field that is really vibrant. I would say that, you know, first gene therapy is getting a lot of attention. Um, everything related to manipulating our genes, or even if I want to connect it to the corona, I would say using nucleic acid to do so. I think we have really living inside uh, a revolution. And, you know, since I had another chair, another hat for five uh, years, which I was sitting as a, um, as an external reviewer in the cell tissue and gene therapy uh, subcommittee of biologics in the FDA. I've seen so many technologies that are evolving and the field of gene therapy is really, really amazing. And I, I'm expecting that in the next few years, we'll see more and more approved uh, strategies. And today we'll hear a remarkable scientist that are very active in this field working in really important area. And I'm looking forward to this. And I just want to pass uh, my mic into uh, Abigail one, and she will present the speakers. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, and thank you, Eli. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I uh, am so excited to be here with two great scientists today. In the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, it is so inspirational to follow their work, their groundbreaking work um, in applying genetic strategies uh, to deafness treatments. And to know that great work in science is going on in all fields as we do as well try to combat this great uh, pandemic. Um, uh, for, for our audience, uh, please note that we have a Q&A button at the bottom of, uh, of your um, view screen and that you can use that Q&A to submit questions as we move along through our program today. Um, but it is my pleasure now um, to introduce our, our two uh, great scientists um, whose work we'll be discussing today, uh, Karen Abraham. Um, with uh, Tel Aviv University uh, and Akihiro Matsuoka, who is with the Feinberg School of Medicine of Northwestern University. Um, just to give you a, a little uh, background on their, um, on their uh, amazing work and uh, positions, uh, Dr. Karen Abraham is Vice Dean of the Sackler Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University, and she holds the doctor's Sarah and Felix Dumont Chair for Research of Hearing Disorders. Uh, she completed a BA in Biology at Washington University in St. Louis, a PhD in Genetics at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and postdoctoral training at the National Cancer Institute in Maryland. Uh, she joined the Department of Human Molecular Genetics and Biochemistry in 1996, and she is a member of the Segal School of uh, Neuroscience and Safra Center for Bioinformatics. She has over 150 publications in international journals, and she's men mentored countless undergraduate masters, MD and PhD students, not to mention postdocs. Uh, Dr. Abraham has, uh, was awarded the Sir Bernard Katz Prize from the Humboldt Foundation and the Bruno Memorial Prize from the Rothschild Foundation, as well as the Teva Prize for groundbreaking research in uh, rare diseases and the Teva Founders Prize in breakthroughs. She's co-director of the Alfsian Family Center for the Prevention and Treatment of Parkinson's Disease and the Taub Corp Global Collaboration in Neurodegenerative Diseases. She founded and directs the Biomed at 
Tel Aviv University Research Hubs, and the master's program in medical sciences and genetic counseling, as well as the single cell genetics core uh, programs. On an international level, she's a member of the International Society for Ear, uh, Inner Ear Therapeutics, the Lancet Commission on Hearing Loss, and, the, and she's uh, chairing the scientific committee of the Foundation pour l'audition in France. Um, Dr. Akihiro Matsuoka is an assistant professor and director of regenerative engineering uh, laboratories at Northwestern University and director of audiology at Northwestern Medicine. He completed an MD and a doctor of medicine uh, of medical science at uh, uh, Kitasato University and he received a PhD in computational neurosciences and electrophysiology at the University of Iowa. He also completed postdoctoral training in stem cell biology at Indiana University and a surgical fellowship in neurotology and skull-based surgery at the University of California of San Diego. Uh, Dr. Matsuoko joined the Department of Otolaryngology and had neck surgery at Feinberg uh, at Northwestern University in 2012. Clinically, he focuses on hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo. Uh, he has performed several hundred cochlear implant surgeries. His research focuses on regenerative engineering. His laboratory aims to develop a biohybrid co cochlear implant by combining the latest state-of-the-art cochlear implant device and an emerging human stem cell therapy for the inner ear. For humanitarian work, he spent time at various hospitals and clinics in China, Japan, and the former CIS countries, teaching healthcare professionals about hear, hearing and uh, ear care. So I would like to turn the program over to them uh, for some introductions into their work. Um, and, and then we'll head into a discussion and again, please do include your uh, questions in our Q&A tab um, at the uh, lower end of your screen. And uh, we'll get to some of those toward the end of the program as well. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Abraham, do you want to open for us? Wonderful, thank you. Professor Farsner, thank you so much for that really lovely introduction to Professor Rekres uh, for uh, starting, coming up with the idea for this webinar and helping put it all together. Professor Peer, also for your generous introduction and to my partner in crime here, Professor Matsuoka. I'm really looking forward to being able to talk to you about our work. Before I start, I wanna also introduce you. There's someone also um, sitting here with us in one of the boxes and that's Shachal Tiber. He's an MD PhD student in our laboratory and he did really all of most most of the work with his own hands and so I thought it would be nice for him to join us as well. So let me share my screen with you and I'm going to show you a brief presentation so that I can highlight the work that we've been doing in the past few years which led us to being at this webinar today. Okay so Again, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to all of you. I imagine you all behind this computer somewhere in different parts of the world. It's a little after six o'clock here in Tel Aviv, and I know um, not quite the middle of the day in Chicago, very different kind of weather, uh, but we are very close. Uh, we, as you heard in the introduction from Ellie, we, we actually spent a lot of time together, our universities, and we hope to be able to do so much more in person in the near future. So what I wanted to share with you today is why we actually explore hearing loss and why is it such a major issue for the many scientists and physicians, health professionals who are working worldwide in this area. So you may know that there are about half a billion people worldwide who have a disabling hearing loss. That's almost 7% of the world population. And there is um, 1.3 billion who have a mild to complete hearing loss in the better hearing ear. So that's about 18%. And in fact, it's the fourth leading cause of years that people have lived with disability. And so this has really become a major health issue and well-being issue as well. Now, the Lancet Commission 
on hearing loss was actually started a number of years ago. And the vision that uh, this commission has, and I'm very honored to be part of this commission, is that we have a world in which hearing loss is no longer a barrier to human communication and fulfillment. And in fact, there are sustainable goals that have been put forth by many groups, including the United Nations, that we not only um, have to uh, alleviate hearing loss, but we also have to get to a point where we have a complete physical, mental, and social well-being for everyone worldwide. And this certainly includes finding ways to alleviate hearing loss. Now, quite coincidentally, or maybe not, it is World Hearing Day today, so I think it's very fitting that we're all meeting today. And in fact, just today, the World Health Organization wrote in their PR that one in four people are projected to have hearing problems by the year 2050. So I think that we can really get an idea of the seriousness involved. And for those of you who either uh, live with a loved one who has hearing problems or a colleague at work, you know that the difficulties that they have interacting, there can be educational, developmental, social pro problems, feelings of isolation. And while about one in 1,000 children are born with a disabling hearing loss, toward um, the point where we get older in life, it could be up to 50% of the population. And so it becomes really important, especially in a day like World Hearing Day, to be not only work toward trying to find treatments and cures, but also to really be sensitive to those around us who have trouble hearing. Now, what I'd like to do is just take you through this a little bit of a movie and just to give you an idea of the details that are involved in hearing. It's something that we don't quite appreciate as much as we perhaps should, the intricacy of the inner ear. So that wave that you see going through are sounds that are collected by the outer ear, which consists of the auricle and the external auditory canal. The sound is guided through the ear canal to the middle ear, and those are the bones that you see. And so when the sound arrives at the eardrum, there's a flexible circular membrane which starts to vibrate when the sound waves strike it. The sound waves are then passed down by the movement of the eardrum to the middle ear, and these are those three tiny bones, refer to the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and they are the tiniest bones in our body. And these form a bridge from the eardrum to the entrance of the inner ear. Their interaction increases and emphasizes the sound vibrations further before they're fully relayed into the inner ear via what's called the oval window. Now, what you see in the inner ear that's unwinding now is the cochlea, which is very similar in shape to a snail shell and contains several membranous sections which are filled with watery fluids. When these sound waves vibrate, the fluids begin to move and these set, what you're seeing now, these very small hair cells, the sensory cells of the inner ear, in motion. These hair cells then transform the vibrations into electrical signals, which are sent via the auditory nerve and then down to the brain. What, when we, what we call noises are actually just sound waves which are transmitted through air. So that was, I think, a really uh, stunning movie showing you what's happening, and it's happening all the time. Now, those hair cells are actually not hairs, but because of those projections that are coming out, they were called um, hairs by people um, years ago, and the name kind of stuck. Now, about 60% of hearing loss is actually due to genetic variants that are present in genes that are randomly distributed all over the genome. So what you're seeing here are all of the human chromosomes and the names that you see are the different genes that are involved in hearing loss. And so there's about 40% that we believe are not due directly to uh, problems that we have in our genes, but for other types of problems such as autotoxicity, uh, other kind of environmental damage. And much of what we know about our genes today has been collected Quite recently in science, we, there was a series of articles about the human genome at 20, because the Human Genome Project, which started years ago, has really uh, done remarkable work in order for be able to us understand what's happening in not only the genes that are involved in our hearing, but also in the rest of our body. So where does that bring us to the story? I'm going to concentrate on today. Well, there are all of the genes that you saw in the slide previously are involved in, in deafness that's been identified in families all over the world. 
And this is work that we've been doing for many years to identify what the genetic basis is of hearing loss in, in Israel. What you see here are two Israeli families who have a hearing loss. Uh, it's a progressive hearing loss that starts when they're very young, uh, at about the age of two, and is progressive till about the age of five, and then is pretty much goes to profound. What's really remarkable about the gene that we found that's involved here is that it's a gene that's called SIN4, and it's present, um, if you look at the protein, what we're looking at is a cell here, and if the gray ring here is the nucleus, and this SIN4, which actually codes for a protein called Nesprin4, actually links the nucleus with the cytoskeleton. And it's the cytoskeleton that really keeps the cell together. Uh, much of this work was done by Dr. Sephora Brownstein, who has been working in our lab for about 15, 20 years now. And um, this work came out in 2013 in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And when Shachal joined our lab a couple of years ago, our goal was to really find a way to be able to uh, treat or cure the deafness in these families. But we haven't been able to go quite that far yet, and we'll talk a little bit about the connection in a minute, but we, the next best thing we could do is actually work on a mouse model. And what's particularly striking about that mice, mouse model is that the hair cells that we showed you earlier in that movie the nucleus needs to be at the base of the stereo, the base of that hair cell in order for the outer hair cell to work properly. But because we lose this anchoring of the nesprin from the nucleus to the cytoskeleton, the nucleus floats up to the top of the hair cell and for a long cascade of reasons, hearing doesn't function. So the approach that we decided to take to gene therapy was one that has been used previously, not only in other diseases, but also hearing loss, and that's using um, a synthetic adeno-associated AV capsid. And it's shown here, the, the capsid that we use, but I do wanna remark that there are other alternatives to gene therapy. RNA is one form, and of course, we've heard uh, a great deal about what's happening with RNA with the vaccines for COVID. CRISPR-Cas9, which is another genome editing tool that many of you have probably heard about. A lot of news that's going on. In fact, this is one of the major ways that Don Baer, who introduced us earlier, is doing the therapy that he is for looking at cancer. But we decided to stick to using this AV gene therapy. It had been used previously before, and there are a lot of advantages to being able to use this gene therapy. One of them is that it's non-immunogenic, and so the advantage there is that you don't have to worry about deleterious effects. It integrates at very low rates is what you want. You, want, you do not want it to become part of the genome and call any, any harm. There's efficient transduction. It goes into the cells very well. In fact, the AV that we used goes into the cells at about almost pretty much 100% rate and it can't self-replicate. And so we were very honored to be able to enter into this work with our collaborator, Professor Jeff Holt, who's at Boston Children's and Harvard. And you already see uh, Shachal here, one of the boxes. And there are other uh, investigators who are involved in this work. And one thing I have to say about science, it's very much of a team effort and always very many people who are involved in every step of the way. So we were lucky to be able to publish this work a couple of months ago. It came out in Embo Molecular Medicine. And let me just tell you some of the highlights that came out of it. So first of all, if we compare an audiogram of a normal hearing mouse, which you can see in green down at the bottom, to a mouse that's deaf, and I wanna highlight that this mouse doesn't contain the gene SIN4, which is the same type of mutation that was found in these Israeli families. And there's also families that have been found in England and in Turkey. So if you treat these mice with this AV, which is what, um, what Shachal did. So first he took an AV without a gene and he used a green fluorescent protein. And you can see that black line very clearly, these mice are still deaf. And this served as our control that the AV wasn't going to be causing any damage or having any other type of effect. But if you add the SIN4 gene, so an additive effect to this AV, you can see that these mice are almost have just as good hearing as the mice with the normal hearing. And this is a test that was done at about four weeks of age, but what was really compelling is that this has continued 
till past 12 weeks of age. And so we've really been able to go through the test of time and we're confident because of work that's been done elsewhere that this will continue even longer. Now, what happened actually in terms of the morphology and the function of the cells, where we really, the ultimate test is to show that the mice are hearing, which we could do. But I also wanna show you that if you look at the base of these hair cells, and you can see the blue nuclei that are sitting at the bottom, if you look at a deaf mouse, you can see that the nucleus is somewhere in the middle and really moving its way up toward the top if we would look at these cells a couple of days later. If you now look at the cells that were rescued, cells that came out of the mice that were rescued with the AV and the SYN4 gene, you can see that the nuclei are very nicely placed at the bottom of these cells. And graphically, you can see this positioning by looking at the graphs, you can see them uh, down toward the bottom versus the top. And then again, looking at the rescued mouse, you can see that the nucleus is very nicely situated at the bottom. On the left side, we're showing you a very beautiful outline of what's called the inner outer hair cells and the, the inner and the outer hair cells. And you can see uh, that these cells are just in really perfect form. But the most important thing is we really want to be able to move away from the models that we've been using and move to humans. And how can we do that? And what are the challenges that are involved? Well, we'll hear from Professor Matsuoko about the work um, of some of those challenges and work as well. And he's been able to apply some of that because he is a physician, but we're working on trying to understand what these challenges are because what we need to be able to do is that the surgery, the surgery, surgery will be minimally invasive, will target cells along the entire length. We have to talk about the age group, the type of hearing loss, the type of delivery. And there are already some uh, over 200 clinical trials with AV, as well as um, uh, current AV gene therapy that's done. And I want to, the last point, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you uh, briefly about the COVID-19 pandemic and to share with you the work that our colleague Amiel Dror from the northern, uh, north of Israel, the Galilee Medical Center has done. He's looked at hundreds of patients who have recovered from COVID. They do not appear to have uh, hearing loss, so this is really good news. And we've been trying to show that it's so critical in order to have good communication. We published a paper not too long ago, and I just want to be very proud of the fact that we have over half a million views um, of people who have been da downloaded our paper. What we really hope is the ministries of health worldwide who are not uh, uh, sharing the information the way that they best could so that the disabled can get that information, that they'll change their ways and it'll be better for the whole community. And finally, I wanna leave you with our really wonderful group who has shared some or all of this work and to thank you uh, for listening. So I will stop my sharing and turn it over now to Professor Matsuoko. Aki, you're muted. We don't hear you yet. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Thank Perfect. you, Dr. Abraham and uh, Dr. Okay. Matsuoko. Please t take it over. Okay. Can you guys see my slide? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Share oh, screen. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to uh, participate in this wonderful uh, opportunity. Um, what I would like to talk about for the next eight, eight minutes is about how we can translate the basic science result into a, a clinical trials in humans. And there are mainly three hurdles here where we need to think about. Number one is anatomical challenge. The Karen just uh, showed us a nice movie and then audience uh, now have a good idea where um, what kind of structure and what kind of functionality of the structure in the human body we are dealing with. 
If you look at this slide over here, this is the uh, external auditory canal, the width of which is basically three millimeter in size. If we remove this structure, then we can see the inner ear where basically the size of width is five to seven meter, millimeter in size. If you could take a look at the uh, figure over here, as uh, the uh, Karen in, uh, told us, there are three different chambers in the inner ear. Those are fluid filled. And I just wanted to show one movie where I uh, obtained from one of my patients. Um, and this is a human inner ear. You could take a look. Um, so this chamber, the one below, is cons uh, consistent with the scalar tympani. This shiny structure over here, these are the white outer hair cells. And then, oh, it's kind of a little bit moving here. This one is inner ear cell, inner, inner hair cells. And these hair cells are connected to the brain with the new fibers running uh, from here all the way into the bone. So the most important things I would like you guys to know about this is the diameter from here to here is just 600 microns which is less than one millimeter in size. And then unfortunately, in this sense, this inner ear is encased in the hardest bone in the human body. So in order to get access to it, we have to do a lot of engineering so that we can, as the, the Dr. Abraham said, we have to do this the minimum invasive way. And that's the challenge we have. The other thing I wanted to mention here is the local environment in that inner ear is basically the fluid filled chamber. So basically constantly there is a fluid running inside the structure. So what we need to think about is whatever we do, whatever say we transplant the cells in the in this chamber, they will be immediately washed away. Well, what if we, let's say we inject some gene, they will be immediately washed away. So in a sense, it's not actually washed away, but it's, we cannot actually localize exactly where those reagent or biological material should go to. Um, so that's actually a part of the biological challenge, which is the second thing. The other thing I just wanted to stress here is that inner ear contains so many different anatomical structures. Um, actually, Abigail said this to us previously, that it's an intergalactical space. There are so many different types of structures, such as inner hair cells, outer hair cells, I'm not going to name everything, but supporting cells, stereo vasculitis, stereo ligament, tectorial membrane, auditory nerve, each one of them, if has a problem, patient will have a healing loss. The question is where exactly we need to go to. That's the sort of thing still entirely unclear. Sometimes the problem is in the outer hair cells. Sometimes the problem is in inner hair cells. So how would we be able to know exactly where we need to go to? That's about main biological challenge here. Third thing, which is a social challenge, but I think I'm going to uh, wrap up my talk uh, by talking social challenge. Let me just go through some of the studies we have been, we are currently doing in my lab. We are particularly interested in this biological challenge. To overcome with this, we uh, were collaborating with uh, many other, lab various other labs to uh, basically establish this goal. We have come up with a protocol where we now are able to generate um, the stem cells from patient's skin or blood. We, then we, as when we generate the human stem cells from the blood or patient's own skin, we have also established a protocol where we differentiate undifferentiated stem cells excuse me, into the auditory neurons. With this protocol, we now we are trying to form the three-dimensional uh, aggregates. 
the idea being here is if, instead of injecting the single suspended cell, which will be washed away immediately, what if we basically transplant these three-dimensional structures? They are forming, uh, this is called the spheroid, and they are positive for the appropriate neuronal markers. Uh, what we are now doing is using nanotechnology, where nanotechnological uh, biology can generate the uh, supporting matrix with which those stem cell derived spheroid can basically stay in one location so that they can differentiate it, more appropriately differentiate into the neurons. We're also using um, some type of um, protein crystals so that these crystal can elude the uh, neurotrophins so that they can uh, get the nutrition and uh, all that kind of stuff from these crystals. So this is to show the one of the example in the petri dish where we have a spheroid that we are able to differentiate them into the neuron neurons. As you can see, these are the bipolar uh, auditory neurons. They are mark not exactly the same, but their markers are positive for the appropriate auditory neurons. What we're also interested in is to try to get the vascular structures uh, into this um, spheroid. So this is also to show, uh, this is also the, the one of the microfluidic device we developed, actually we are collaborating with, where this is a spheroid and spheroid, all those vascular structures now growing into this spheroid. And this is to show the three-dimensional um, reconstruction of this figure where these vascular structures are actually growing inside a spheroid. So now those spheroids are, as you can see, positive for the appropriate markers for the human stem cells and then appropriate markers for the neurons, not necessarily auditory neurons on this figure. Um, then uh, this is to show the actual size of the spheroid, which is very tiny. And then we use uh, a surgical technique to transplant each of those spheroids into the mouse, uh, in this case, scalar tympani. Uh, as you can see here, the size of width here is 500 microns. So we are, as, as I said before, we are dealing with a very uh, tiny structures here. This is, by the way, the mouse, a mouse uh, surgery. Now, if we could take a look at this, by now, you guys probably got some idea that inner ear has three different fluid field chambers. So this is to show that this is one of the, the our surgical uh, example where we transplanted a five spheroid into this scalar tympani. And they've not, they actually migrated into the scalar vestibule, unfortunately, however, this is to show the red cells are human stem cell derived neurons. And then, as you can see, red cells are here and here. They survive uh, 10 days after the surgery. And then they already start developing this type of axons or dendrite or neurite, whatever you call it. And they are growing toward this endogenous mouse spiral ganglion neurons. So this result is to us are very encouraging. This means that we are potentially generate a new uh, neuronal, auditory neuronal networks in the scale of tympani, with which we are hoping that we can combine this type of biological technology with the pre-existing cochlear implant. But that's still the miles away uh, from this from us right now. To wrap up my talk, I just wanted to touch upon briefly about the social challenge. I think this is probably maybe the most important thing among these challenges, but unfortunately I don't have much background to attack this challenge. So hearing loss could be a sign of aging, could be a vanity issues, and it could be a self-perception problem. Could be, you know, those who are hearing loss can be socially stigmatized. They have a, sometimes a large communication barriers with others. The biggest problem is this is simply invisible. 
And sometimes you don't even know whether you have a hearing loss or not if they have a higher frequency hearing loss. And lastly, there has been many studies. They are not complete study yet. There have been the association indicating there might be some link between the severe hearing loss and Alzheimer's disease. This research needs to be done you know, more uh, rigorously, however. I actually personally have a couple of patients where after the cochlear implant, their cognitive ability has been much improved. So this, this, this may be anecdotal evidence, but we probably definitely need to uh, consider this type of possibility. And then the mostly, we probably need to educate the society that hearing loss, as Dr. Abraham's slide too, hearing loss is a big problem, but it's just it's simply just simply invisible. But with that, I would like to conclude my talk and I'd like to uh, uh, give back my microphone to Abigail. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Abraham and Dr. Uh, Matsuoka. Uh, uh, we are, are absolutely staggered, I'm sure I speak for all of us about this groundbreaking research and certainly considering that um, one half billion people are suffering from a disabling hearing loss. The stakes are really high here uh, for um, this amazing research you're doing. Um, would you share with us perhaps um, a bit about what are the next steps to actually move the research um, from the point where it is now to a point where it might be uh, actually uh, useful in treating patients? So if, if you'd like, I can take that. And thank you, uh, Professor Matsuoka. That was really fantastic. And I think our work is so complementary to one another and it's always wonderful to hear it. So uh, really what's next for us, because again, we're doing everything on research-based. Uh, Shaha will be an MD one day and we'll be able to take this forward to, to patients. But in the meantime, we're doing this all at the bench. And of course, I, I don't think that this is an audience I need to emphasize how important the basic research is in yeah. order to work out all the details. What we've started doing now in Israel is really generating a dialogue with the health professionals who are seeing, uh, who are working with, with patients. Um, because if we want to, first of all, be able to integrate any of the studies, clinical trials that are being done worldwide into Israel, then we need to be able to know who our patients are, what the target population is, what the challenges might be, particularly in Israel or just in general. We know a little bit less, obviously, about what the needs are. So we're forming now a consortium uh, with ENTs, uh, speech therapists, audiologists, medical geneticists, and I, I think that that's really going to help us. So what we're waiting for is one of the, there are about 40 companies now, maybe a bit more, who have come into this space of cell and gene therapy, and we're hoping some of them say that there'll be clinical trials in the next couple of years, and we very much hope that we'll be able to help work with the population here in Israel to be able to introduce them here. Okay. So what we... What I think is necessary, as I said, is to um, stem cell research is still in a very embryonic state in the inner year. As I said, inner year has a lot of challenges. Not, for example, retin retinopathy or retinal regeneration um, have been already treated with human-induced pluripotent stem cells, humans. I think about the eyes and the ears. Eyes are fortunately has much, much easier access surgically as opposed to the inner ear. It has a very, as I alluded earlier, a lot of anatomical barriers. But we have been actually some of the uh, groups in the Johns Hopkins have published the uh, paper recently where we can safely inject a small amount of um, saline into the inner ear without destroying the structure. So that's actually probably the first step for us to not to harm the patient. Then we also have a lot of issues about stem cells. For example, they could become a cancer. We have a hypoimmunogenic stem cells, however, is it really, totally immune, immune rejection free. 
What about the uh, viral infection we used? There are a lot of things we need to approve before we can start uh, do, um, performing these therapies in actual patient. Um, that's all I have here. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Abraham, you alluded to the uh, to the important um, context of of uh, collaboration in this uh, research, taking it in various directions. So, you know, you're you're uh, researching delivery of a genetic payload in a harmless synthetic virus that would repair defective genetics in the inner ear. And uh, Dr. Matsuoka, you're studying embryonic stem cells and artificial stem cells that can preferentially regenerate auditory neurons. So, so how are these genetic approaches and research uh, related? And, and what might be some of the potential uh, synergies in pursuing these uh, different treatments? Well, so first of all, I, I think we have to all realize that we really are in the age of precision medicine, where one size does not fit all. And so we have so many different uh, people with a hearing loss for many different reasons, uh, some for genetics, some for environmental. And it's really important to understand the cause of hearing loss as much as you can in each one of these individuals so that you can really precisely target the type of therapy that's going to be done. I think in our case, if we would fast forward to a time where gene therapy with AV and therapy, um, the way that Aki has, has introduced, that they're really being done almost routinely. And we could imagine that. There are things that are done today that we wouldn't have even dreamt of 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. So it could be that you'll have a situation where the gene therapy will be introduced, but you really need to give a bit more of a bump and introducing stem cells that'll be functional will actually make a difference to add both of those together. And then there'll be other cases where they should be dealt with separately. It might also be that cochlear implants, which are used today um, to alleviate hearing loss, that they will be actually enhanced and improved by either one form or another of the therapy that we talked about. In fact, some of the companies are looking into broadening their range once this type of therapy becomes accessible. Great, okay. Um, Dr. Matsuoka? Yes, um, I very much agree with Karen. Um, for example, as I said, there are so many different structures in a, in a year. So we may require to not only treat other hair cells, but also we may still treat the auditory neurons at the same time. Without the neurons, hair cells are very helpless. Hair cell needs to convey the neuronal signal to the brain through the nerve. Mm -hmm. So in a way, people who are trying to regenerate the outer hair cells or inner hair cells or auditory neurons needs to collaborate each other or help each other so that eventually we can fix this whole auditory pathway. We're not just talking about one part. We need to we may not be able to get to the cerebral cortex yet, but at least at the peripheral level, we need a more and more collaborations with multidisciplinary approach. I think that's probably the most important things we need to move toward. Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, clearly it's that will give doctors and patients a number of choices um, for optimal outcomes. Um, and uh, that, that sounds wonderful to me. Um, let's turn for a moment to a personal note. Um, for each of you, uh, what's been the most surprising or exciting moment in your research? I have, to, I have to admit that I have so many of them. I could take you all the way back to my PhD life and try to stay in the present. Uh, so I think if we're going to talk about the context of this project, I remember when Shahal's first results, uh, he was using a different vector, slightly different techniques, and the mice were okay, but they were still didn't have great hearing. And so we, it was a moderate but a significant improvement. Uh, and then we changed our strategy and that really did the magic trick. And now you saw the results. I mean, they're really remarkable. Uh, and so it was when we made that transition 
And we saw that we could really, by working incredibly hard, um, but also really be persistent and not give up, that we could do it. So, and I do remember when Shachal first told me those uh, those results. And there, there's this is this is what makes all of the difficult days of doing research and experiments that don't work. It makes it all worth it. There's no question about it. Good. <laughs> all right. Okay, so yes, sure. So it could be more surprising or may not be surprising. But one of the things I wanted to mention is about the human stem cells. So depending upon which, uh, where we get the, the cells, I thought originally long time ago that stem cells are stem cells, human stem cells are stem cells. Mm -hmm. But depending upon where it came from or where, which structure we drive it, or what type of you know, male, females, there are so many different variabilities. And actually, so it's a human stem cells or human embryonic stem cells induce pluripotent stem cells. They are omnipotent. However, each one of them sometimes behave very differently. So we, as I said, I... I said I established a protocol, you know, but that's probably a little bit of overstatement. Depending upon the strain, depending upon the kind of stem cells, I always have to learn from actually cells that I am, we still need to modify individually. So as just Karen just brought out, personal medicine is in upcoming. So we probably really need to individualize the treatment, which would potentially incur more cost. So for which we probably need to educate the society so that we can get more you know, funding and all that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, and we do have a question here uh, from the audience uh, to you, Dr. Uh, Matsuoka and uh, Dr. Abraham, you might want to uh, uh, contribute to this as well. Uh, the question is this, uh, is there access to vestibular hair cells um, easier? Is the access to vestibular hair cells easier or harder than to hair cells in the organ of Corti? Uh, okay, so I think it depends. Is both of them are in the scale of media, uh, so it's actually the more protected area. So. If I think about the anatomy, probably the best of your hair cells are a little bit easier to access. However, as I said, we are talking about a few hundred microns. So I really cannot tell exactly um, which one is easier, but there may be a possibility that best of your hair cells access is easier than auditory um, outer hair cells, inner hair cells. Okay. The only thing that I want to add is that the person who asked the question is Professor David Sprinsack, who is also part of our team. So, I'm very oh. <laughs> all right, great. Okay, uh, any final comments that we haven't covered, or uh, something else that has emerged from our discussion that you'd like to add at this point? I want to just go back to the point where I showed that there are hundreds of genes that are involved in in hearing yeah. loss. I think that that is one of the challenges that we'll have because we could really consider that each form of hearing loss is a rare disease. And that means that we have expectations that a company will decide to implement a whole strategy to uh, maybe work when there's a handful of families, uh, 10,000 families, it really depends on which gene we're talking about. But I am optimistic because the easier this technology gets, and I mentioned that there are already uh, there, there's clinical trials going on, there's already work, there's already treatments that are out there for two diseases. Uh, I think that, that as it gets easier, then the platform will also be used also for rare diseases. And I think that's very encouraging, not only for hearing loss, but for other rare diseases as well. This past right. Sunday was World Rare Disease Day, and I think it highlights and hopefully gives people hope that, that um, companies will will put in the resources that are needed to be able to find cures and therapies, however rare they are. Okay, sounds good. Well, we'll keep up with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Matsuoka? Sure. Um, so what I would like to stress here is the importance of 
collaboration and team approach. Uh, especially since I jo act joined Northwestern, uh, Northwestern University allowed me to collaborate with um, other investigators much more easily, such as uh, Dr. Samuel Stoop, Dr. Jack Kessler, Neurology, Material Science, Dr. Ami uh, the Guillermo Amir uh, from the Bioengineering Department. Uh, without other co this collaboration, I would not have been able to make any progress. And then Northwestern is, in my career, the best environment, allowing me just just stop by into the lab and start asking a question, and they would say, "Yeah, okay, well, what you know, <laughs> let's do it." So yeah. I really like the uh, you know that type of approach as opposed to oh yeah you're gonna have to make an appointment you know at three o'clock you know so i really like this environment uh, for uh, collaboration and then hopefully i can collaborate with dr abraham in the future or the tel aviv university and you know for that matter anybody who are interested in attack uh, tackling these challenges well thank you it's great to know we're leveraging all these brilliant minds. So, Abigail, can I, I turn it over to uh, uh, Eli to uh, uh, move on with our program? Yeah, I don't think we have much more time to move on, but I want to <laughs> pick up on, on this last point of collaboration and cooperation that uh, Aki, you mentioned. So, so you referred to Northwestern, to the local environment and landscape, but what about the international cooperation? Because what we see here is an attempt to collaborate, to uh, arrange uh, for two researchers to meet uh, two people who I assume uh, have not cooperated in the past. What is happening on the international level at an age of globalization? I mean, globalization is the keyword. Everybody's mm. globalizing today. So what is happening on, on this level? Because I assume that well, of course, there is internet and there's, there used to be international uh, conventions. Yes. Well, it is much actually easier for us to collaborate now in a way that, you know, as much as, I don't know if how much you guys like Zoom meetings every day, but with Zoom, we can connect to anybody, but we're just not so used to maybe this type of communication. However, I think we should probably utilize this type of method as, as much as I love traveling to, you know, Tel Aviv or other countries, we may be able to establish as much as progress by using the Zoom. Mm -hmm. So it's probably one of the good things happened during this pandemic, in my opinion. Yeah, I will add that international collaboration is, is absolutely essential. Uh, and we see it all over because um, I think what we've all learned is you find the best people who you can work with to do the job. And it's great if they're next to you, but it's also just as good as if they're halfway around the world. And we are very lucky in this age of technology and with airplanes, which used to fly a lot, mm -hmm. maybe a little less now, but I think we'll get back there again. I do think that this form of communication has in some ways it's helped. I think it's a little harder to establish new collaborations, a little harder to network, um, but it's certainly been relatively easy to continue existing collaborations. So this is a tremendous opportunity because Aki and I would love to start working together. I think that our work can really complement one another, but there's no question that worldwide for this research uh, and for any research, working together in teams uh, and particularly in genomics, you see that you have many, many people who are working together. Um, you know, while Shahal is a tremendous student and can do a lot, he's only one person. And it's the same for all of the other people who are in our labs. And so as much synergy and working together you can, um, it's strong. Of course, we need funding and other types of vehicles that make it a little easier, but there's no question that working together makes, uh, makes all the difference in, in the work that we're doing. Yeah, well, I cannot but agree as someone has been trying to promote this uh, this avenue of, of collaboration and cooperation, absolutely. So one comment that I must share with you, thoughts that uh, have been going through my mind is that this, uh, this venue is relatively limited. I mean, you can have 100, 200 participants, a big number. Um, but what I think we should put um, 
uh, we should try to do is to make sure to market the product uh, through uh, through the websites, through YouTube, uh, to make sure that uh, people know of the recording that is available. Um, perhaps even a printed uh, version of what has been happening in this webinar and others, so it is reachable um, uh, on even uh, such uh, a vehicle as Google Scholar. Uh, because very important things have been uh, said and mentioned here. Even the discussion uh, is important. So uh, I think we should we should think uh, and, and discuss what can we do. What what more can we do with the ultimate product? But anyway, our time is over. It's exactly an hour, and I would like to thank wholeheartedly uh, first to the uh, discussant, uh, to all the other participants who took part, to the audience who came. Uh, from wherever you are, um, and um, call for more such uh, events, and uh, hopefully we'll meet again soon. Thank you very much for all those who came, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever blessing there is. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Wonderful to meet with you.